Good day and welcome to JCC Sunday Schools in Session, where Sunday School matters to God. Please like and leave us a comment. Also, join us by subscribing to our channel. We love to have you in the JCC family. Our lesson is coming from John chapter 19, verses 16 through 30, and it's titled Crucifixion and Death. Our lesson today deals with Christ's crucifixion. We know there was a brutal crucifixion, but Christ went to the cross willingly to die for our sins. Let's get into the lesson and see what it has to offer us today. Our lesson from last week ended with Christ on trial before Pilate. Question 1 asks, why did Pilate not want to convict Christ in order to put him to death? In our last appeal for mercy, we see Pilate ask the chief priest, shall I crucify your king? This is in verse 15. Notice their response. We have no king but Caesar. Their Messiah had come, but because he went against their worldly plans, threatened their worldly status, their positions and privilege, they renounced him as their king and accepted a worldly king who has no eternal life to give. They did not have faith in the word of prophecy nor in any faith in the Lord. See, the point in this right here is we must be careful who we give our alliances to. Do we pledge allegiance to the world or do we say, for God I live and for God I will die? The world tells us we cannot serve two masters. If it is God that we pledge our allegiance to, he requires us to be first in our lives. Not some of the time, but all the time. We must be careful to not allow our desires to please our selfish desires get in the way. It will never allow one to please God and be the child of God that God wants us to be. Let's get into our verses now and see what they have to say. Verses 16 through 22 read, then delivered he him before unto them to be crucified. And they took Jesus and led him away. And he bearing his cross went forth into a place called the place of a skull, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him and two others with him on either side, one and Jesus in the midst. And Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross. And the writings was Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. This title then read many of the Jews for the place where Jesus was crucified was nigh to the city, and it was written in Hebrew and in Greek and in Latin. Then said the chief priest to the Jews of Pilate, Write not, king of the Jews, but that he said, I am king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. Our first outline shows us Christ being led away to be crucified in a place in Hebrew that is called Golgotha. Question two asks, What was another name for Golgotha, and what did it mean? Another name for Golgotha is Calvary, and both words means skull. It was a place of death that had the image of death as well. This was a skull-shaped hill in ancient Jerusalem that was outside the city. In Genesis 3 and 15, we have the first prophecy of the coming of the Lord Jesus to be the Savior of mankind. And it says, And I will put hostility between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall crush your head, and ye shall bruise his heel. The crushing of Satan's head is our first clue as to why Jesus was crucified on Calvary, the place of the skulls. Moses had prophetic written that there will come a time when the future seed of a woman will crush the head of the serpent. The significance of Jesus being crucified on Calvary, the place of the skull, was to show his victory over his enemy. Yes, he had victory over Satan, and this was fulfilling the prophecy of Genesis 3.15. As the nails would have been driven through the heels of the one crucified, the prophecy of Genesis 3 and 15 was being partially fulfilled as Satan would bruise his heel. The remainder of the prophecy was fulfilled when Jesus was lifted above the ground, the place of the skull, crushing the head of Satan. Jesus was literally in position over his enemies, over the giants of the evilness of this world. Yes, Christ was in position to be over his enemies as he crushed the head of Satan. When he rose from the grave, he had all power in heaven and earth in his hands. Christ conquered death. He conquered sin on the cross for our sakes. May the Lord get the glory for all that he has done for our sakes. See, the point is Christ bore his cross for us. Now we're called to bear ours for him. The songwriter said, must Jesus bear the cross alone and all this world go free? But there's a cross for everyone and there's a cross for me. Are we bearing our cross today? Luke 9, 23 and 24 says, Then he said unto them all, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny himself, take up their cross daily, and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. See, yes, in the days of Christ, the cross was Rome's ultimate instrument of death. It was torturous. It was horrific. It was the worst way to die. 
and God used a hellish process to accomplish his heavenly outcome. The cost of discipleship is death to my old sinful self and joyfully embodying Christ's resurrected life. See, in Romans 6, verses 6 and 7, it says, For we know that our old self was crucified with him, so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin, because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. To God be the glory. Question 3 asks, Who was crucified alongside Christ? Two criminals were crucified along with Jesus. This here fulfilled Isaiah 53 and 9, and also verse 12. He made his grave with the wicked, and was numbered with the transgressors. We see Christ gives hope to a thief on the cross. Three crosses, three men, two needed salvation, and only one could provide it. Christ extended mercy to one of the thieves. Luke 23 and 43 says, Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Yes, Christ, even on the cross, provided salvation for one who was willing to repent. To God be the glory again. Question 4 asks, What was the purpose of the placard on the cross? A placard was usually placed to inspire fear. So this placard is there to identify the crime for which a person was to be executed. See, Christ's placard had his crime that he stated, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. We know he had to die for our sins, but they charged him for being a king, which he was spiritually true. He was a king and so much more. He died because he came to be the Messiah and Savior of the world. To God be the glory. Question five says, in what language was the message on the placard written and why? It was written in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. It was done so all would be able to understand what was written on it. See, the point is, those who do not know the Lord may unwittingly testify to who he is. Yes, you may not know who he is, but God can use you to still be a testimony to testify to who he is. Question six asks, how did Pilate respond to the request to change the words on the placard? He was not in the mood to be entertained by these Jewish leaders anymore. He refused their request to change the placard to the Christ only claimed to be the king of the Jews. He says, what I have written is written. See, the point is that the Lord God uses even the mockery of unbelievers to shine light on the truth. In the end, God will get the glory and the world may be one who tells his story. Verses 23 through 24 read, Then the soldier, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts to every soldier a part, and also his coat. Now the coat was without seam, woven from the top throughout. They said, therefore, among themselves, Let us not rend it, but cast lots for it, whose it shall be, that the scripture might be fulfilled, which said, They parted my raiment among them, and for my vesture they did cast lots. These things, therefore, the soldiers did. Question 7 asks, What happened to Jesus' clothing? The soldiers gambled for what would be called his tunic. They gambled by using and casting lots. See, by casting lots for Jesus' garments, the soldiers showed they attached a higher value to his clothing than they did to him. Think about that. People casted more value to his clothing than they did to our Savior. This fulfilled a messianic prophecy by casting lots for Jesus' garments. The point is everything that the Lord declares will come to pass in exact detail. God is a God who cannot lie. If he said it, it will happen. Judgment day is coming. The dead in Christ will rise. Armageddon will come to pass. Every prophecy proclaimed occurred when it was ordained to do so. God and his son proclaim eternal life if we are in his hands and eternal death if, the, if we choose not to be. Verses 25 to 27 read, Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister Mary with the wife of Cleophas and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom he loved, he said unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then said he to the disciples, Behold thy mother. And from that hour that disciple took her unto unto his own home. Question 8 asks, How did Jesus make provisions for his mother? When Jesus said to Mary, Behold thy son, He was telling her she should now think of John as her son. He would be taking his place. Then he said to John, Behold thy mother. He was likewise telling John he should now consider Mary his mother. It was a means whereby Jesus could be assured that Mary would be cared for after his death. Since it seems evident that Joseph had been deceased at this point, Jesus Christ was still making provisions for his mother. He still cared about his mother. He showed his compassion for his mother. See, the point is, even in this suffering, Jesus looked at the needs of those whom he loved. This is a quality all children of God should have. 
In his dying breath, he wanted to ensure his mother was taken care of. This shows us Christ keeps his father's commandments perfectly. It was a responsibility of the eldest son to take care of his parents. Verses 28 through 30 read, After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar and put it upon Hesop and put it in his mouth. And when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished, and bowed his head and gave up the ghost. Question 9 asks, Why did Jesus utter these words, I thirst? The statement, I thirst, was used to fulfill the scripture. When Jesus said, I thirst from the cross, he was alluding to a prophecy in Psalm 22, 15. My mouth is dried up like a pasture, and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. See, the soldier gave him vinegar, and this also was a fulfillment of Psalm 69, 21. They put gall in my food and gave me vinegar for my thirst. All the Old Testament scriptures were fulfilled through Jesus' crucifixion. John showed that everything was happening in accordance to God's plan. God had orchestrated everything to come to pass, and he even told us about it before it happened. Question 10 asks, what is the significance of Jesus' declaration, it is finished? Far from being an admonition of defeat, it is finished is an affirmation of victory. Jesus' redemptive work to save the lost, to save us as sinners, was now fully complete. He had done everything that he was supposed to do, and the work, was now done. Yes, this was not a cry of defeat. It was a shout of victory. To God be the glory. See, the point, we can put all our trust in the Lord because he finished his work. He finished his assignment. The world who receives his redemptive work can now be free. Free from guilt. Free from shame. Free from the bondage of sin and death. Free to have the right back to the tree of life. We are now free. Free indeed. Brothers and sisters, we are free if we have Jesus as our Lord and Savior. See, it is finished. It may not seem like it at the, at the time, but this was again a shout of victory. Jesus' mission was complete, and sin had been fully and finally atoned for. But how can a man shout in victory with his last words? The reason is simple. Jesus knew that he would be resurrected three days later and never to die again. The finished work of cross sets us free, brothers and sisters. It sets us free to die only once as well. If we have accepted Christ as our personal Savior and Redeemer, we die the physical death, but never a spiritual death. Only those who don't know him die twice. If he's not your Lord and Savior, you can receive him right now. You can receive his finished work so that you might be saved too. That you might not have to die only the physical death, but you will live eternally with him. Well, as always, I hope you've enjoyed the lesson. If so, please drop us a comment or two. Also, join us by subscribing to our channel. We would love to have you. Well, that's all for this week. Come back next week. Same time, same channel. Be blessed now.